What the fuck are you doing here today? Ben looked up from the package of penne in his hand, and it was Jen. Jen with her high-bound sheaf of wheatish hair and somewhat sockily sexy physique that filled her store uniform. She was wearing her usual friendly smirk, which he liked to believe was subliminally flirtatious. Store loyalty, I guess, he said, smiling and putting the pen in the basket on his other arm. Besides the fact that I can't afford to shop across the street at Independent. She chuckled. Me neither. Let's keep it down, she added a little softly, not so jokingly, with a vigilant glance up the aisle. I'm on a mission today, he said, taking Amanda's list out of his coat pocket and looking at it. Shopping for my housemate, too. Oh, right, she said. You share a house with your girlfriend. Well, she's not my girlfriend, he said. Twenty years ago, yes, but not anymore. Aha, she said, with the faintest hint of skepticism. She gave him an embarrassingly obvious look of assessment. Then her gaze dropped to his basket. Well, she hasn't got you shopping for anything out of the ordinary. No pork chops or anything. She's vegetarian, too? He suffered a moment of confusion. No, actually, he said. I hadn't thought of it, but no. She just happens not to have asked me to pick up any, anything like that. Jen smirked benignly. Good to see you, Ben, she said, shifting onto her other foot, preparing to move on. Tomorrow. He grinned, and she continued up the aisle. Standing in line at one of the checkout aisles, on the now weirdly unfamiliar customer sign, he reflected on this curious and significant omission of Amanda's, and wondered whether to feel touched or guilty. Months ago, early on, she had included a whole chicken in her list, which she had dutifully brought, bought, but at the cost of much anguish and embarrassment, particularly when, standing in what might have been this very aisle, he had turned to see, next in line behind him, a stunning girl bearing certain esoteric tribal marks of veganism, most notably a pink, skin-tight, meat-is-murder t-shirt, and glaring at him with ethical disgust. There had from time to time been some fleeting friction over his vegetarianism when Amanda would make characteristically sharp-tongued, ironic comments that hinted that she suspected him of a secret moral superiority, a kind of suspicion that he was well used to after a quarter century obs of observance and that was actually essentially sound. Yet here, in her chaste addendum to his personal shopping list, was a touching sign that her love outweighed her suspicion. He reached the cashier, April, another friend, bantered with her affectionately while cramming his purchases into his overburdened knapsack, walked out into the cold sunlight, then made his way through the parking lot to the LCBO, where after a moment's consideration, he picked a one and a half liter bottle of Italian Valpolicella that had once long ago been his own favorite. This he had to carry by hand in an LCBO plastic bag, his knapsack being crammed almost to bursting. As he followed his current favorite route along residential side streets, he found himself singing under his breath a song that had come on the radio in the LCBO, which he had hardly noticed at the time. A cold, penetrating girl soprano sang over a slow, heavy, triple-time beat. Winter night, walk in the streets alone, I look up at the moon, and I know you're looking too, wherever you are, baby, wherever you are, tonight. The melody moved from a muttering low register in the stanza's first half to a soaring plaint in the second, the conventional binary form of the power ballad. It never made sense to think too hard about why a particular popular song stuck in his mind. He was so sensitive to music generally that the reasons for haunting were always more likely than not to be purely musical. But in this case, there was a plausible extra musical factor if he had been looking for it, because obviously he too was longing as he walked the streets alone. Back at the house, he swept the floors from basement to second story, rinsed the dishes and loaded them into the dishwasher, loaded and ran the washing machine and folded clothes from the dryer, sitting on the L-shaped living room sofa and stacking them on either side of him. Lifting a pair of her underpants, he recognized them, cherry red, from one particular afternoon when he had slipped them down her lifted thighs and off over her lifted feet and then realized that he recognized all of them. These slight, varicolored panties, so different from the huge, flopping, sexless things his wife had worn. He raised this pair to his face, inhaled its disappointing odor of fresh detergent. He returned to her bedroom to lay her three stacks on the bed, 
which he had as usual left unmade, since making it felt too perilously close to an implied intimacy. The third stack toppled over. Some object was lying under the bedsheet's sprawling record of restless sleep and waking. He set the stack upright in another place, then hesitated, then needlessly felt, through the sheets, the form of what was obviously a dildo. He thought for a moment, then placed the stack just to the side of it, so that the lump under the sheets now came between the second and third stacks. She would know that he had found it. But why not? What was there to conceal? It was absurd. How were they surviving? He went into his bedroom and lay down. The light outside the window showed early afternoon. He touched his balls through his pants, but remained completely limp. He began to drift down. His breast was heavy with the unspecific anguish that often rose from within at this moment of weakening control. He slept and rose from sleep with no memory of, of dream, with his erection painfully straining against his underpants. The light had, advan had advanced by less than an hour. He lifted his ass, pushed down his pants, and pushed up his shirt, caressed his balls. He closed his eyes and saw her as he wrote her from behind, masturbating her anus with his lubricated thumbs as he had done for her once. He came quickly, without even touching his cut, stretched tight cock. He nearly fainted, breathing hard, heart racing, the weak surge of his ejaculation dribbling into his navel. Afterwards, he lay for some time as his breathing and heartbeat slowed, then sat up, scooped his cum from his navel with one palm before it could slide into his pubic hair, slurped it up, and shuffled down to the edge of the bed, keeping his hand raised. It was time to pick up Felix from school. <laughs>